All right, if you'll get your Bibles out and be turned to the book of Habakkuk, we'll be uh, studying there tonight. And we'll be in Habakkuk chapter number one. As it, when it comes to this Friday and Saturday with the teens, it's a teener Bible. Like I said, we've taken the teens on the past two or three years. I uh, can't remember for sure now. And it's, uh, they always do a good job with it. Uh, I believe that they really pray for it because... You, know, you can always feel the Spirit moving during it, and that's an important thing. So do and be in prayer for that as our teens go. Another thing that I think is good is it is a lot of the same churches that were at camp will also be at this teen re- uh, revival. So some, maybe some of the friends that they made uh, there will be at this revival as well, and they can reconnect. So, But anyway, have you ever had a day... That just didn't go the way that you that you expected. You know the devil's been fighting you all day. That's been me all day all day today. Started off with I forgot my hat this morning, so my face is nice and red today. Cause you know this, I, I've been doing good, and then tried to kill myself. Uh, ran the lawnmower off into the woods, and uh, God God was looking out for me. That went well. Lost a cell phone at the same place. Uh, like I said, if you it, a lot happened today, and uh, Hannah looked at me during supper. I was. Looking out, looking over everything one more time before church, and she said, "You can tell the devil's really fighting you today." And I said, "Well, uh, uh, we won't let him win, so uh, we'll be in prayer about this message, and uh, and I hope we're able to learn something and grow from it." If you found found your place, we're going to read the uh, chapter one. I'll, I'll let you remain seated. Uh, I've thought before maybe it's backwards. Maybe the preacher should sit and everybody else stand, but we won't do that tonight. So anyway, uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 1 says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how, how long shall I cry, and wilt thou not hear? Even cry out unto these of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked. And judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth uh, compass about the righteous. Therefore uh, wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen in regard. And wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days. Which ye will not believe. Though it be told you. For lo I raise up the Chaldeans. That bitter and hasty nation. Which shall march through the breadth of the land. To possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their houses or their horses are swifter than the leopards and more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall uh, uh, shall sup as <clears throat> as the east wind. And they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they, uh, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing uh, this his power unto his God. Art thou... <clears throat> Art thou not forever uh, lasting? O Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes uh, than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And maketh men as fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice under their net and burn incense under their drag. Because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being good to us. We thank you for allowing us to set some time out of the middle of our week to come together in your house and to talk about your word. And Lord, I ask tonight that you empty our hearts and our minds. Lord, and help us focus on you and your word tonight. I ask that you use me as your vessel. Lord, have me to say only the things that you would and nothing more tonight. And Lord, I ask that you just help us to learn something from your word tonight. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Habakkuk is 
you know, one of the minor pro prophets, obviously. And I always, and we were talking about this back uh, last semester of McMinnville School of the Bible, that it's kind of ironic that we call them the minor prophets, because when you get into them, they have some very powerful messages. But nonetheless, they're, they're known as the minor prophets, I guess, because most of them are like Habakkuk here, about three chapters in size or four chapters. They're smaller books, but they contain some great truths in them. Now, Habakkuk, to kind of put you in the, in the time frame that Habakkuk was, he would have been contemporary. He would have been uh, alongside Isaiah. And uh, it is recorded that he is the last minor prophet before Judah's captivity. So he's coming down to the end, that, and it's believed that that took place in about 606 uh, B.C. So uh, not getting too far from the silent years, but uh, that, that's where we find Habakkuk. Now, the nation of Israel at this time, Manasseh, was king. And Manasseh, and we'll talk about this short, here shortly, but Manasseh is recorded as being the worst king in Judah's history. He was a very evil king, and that's probably what has Habakkuk so stirred up and, and tore up as we started reading in verses 2 through 4 that he's so upset. And it's probably because of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh, one of the things that uh, Jewish tradition tells, you're not going to find this in, in, in the Bible, but so I, I want to make that clear that this is Jewish tradition, but they believe that Manasseh tied Isaiah up between two boards and cut him in half. That's the kind of man that he was. So, and the first thing that we, that we come to, as we've already alluded to here, is Habakkuk's prayer. Now, whenever I read this prayer, I found something that I thought was astonishing, Typically, when you, pray, when you hear someone pray for a nation, they're going more of the Second Chronicles 7.14 route of, of, you know, of claiming that. And, and, I, and I, I realize that Israel is, or America is not Israel and the same promises, but there are principles that can be taken there. But many times when we're praying for our nation, that's the route that we go of, you know, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and, and, uh, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear their, hear their prayer. And, that, and that's the kind of prayer that we expect to read whenever we're praying for a nation. But that's not what we find here. Here we find uh, Habakkuk praying to God to judge their nation. And I, and, I, and I found that strange because, again, that's not typically the way my mind works anyway. Now, I should have said this, said this sooner, but for a quick summary of the book of Habakkuk, I've heard it summarized over simply, in just a few sentences. First of all, Habakkuk asks God to judge their land. God says, okay. Habakkuk says, no, not like that. God says, no, like this. And Habakkuk says, okay. That's your very brief summary of the book of Habakkuk. And, and so we're in this place where he's going through his list of petitions. Again, we've talked about what he has seen that probably happened to Isaiah during this time and what a terrible King Manasseh is. And in, in another place, the Bible records that the, that the streets ran with blood. So this was a very wicked place to be. And obviously, could you, we talk about it, you know, how, how rough some of our inner cities here in the United States are getting. And, and to look at that every day, and that's one of the things that Habakkuk brings up to God, where he says, why dost thou show me iniquity? Why are you showing me these things and not doing anything about it, is what, God, is what Habakkuk is saying to God. And, uh, and again, as he continues, he's going through this list, and, 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 and he says, Lord, I want judgment on this land. You need to be I guess we need to be careful what we pray for because uh, I heard it said in a prayer class one time, the teacher said, you, know, you should be careful when you're praying because if you pray, I'm going I'm to pick on Brother George for a second, but if you say, Lord bless Brother George, that sounds like an okay prayer, right? Brother George, are you saved? Yes. yes. So if you, if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. Yes. So you could say it would be a blessing to go to heaven, right? Yes, so that's why you need to be careful when you pray, because Lord bless Brother George, and you know I'm kind of you know I kind of like him. I like him being here. I, you know I'll be happy when he's in heaven, but at the same time I don't want that to happen none too soon. So you need to be careful when you pray, uh, because you might get what you ask for, just not the way that you wanted it. And that's exactly what happens to Habakkuk here. 
He sees this need. He sees all these things. He, he talks about the judgment. And, I, and my mind is going forth. There's some things that make, that, make, that make us think that he was a Levite as we read because he makes some uh, musical references. So he was one who was in the temple. So I, I wonder if it, he didn't see uh, priests who weren't very godly. You know, we see cases of that throughout the scripture. So it, it's it's. Uh, it's a possibility that he sees the priests and they're like uh, the and they're like Eli's sons. If we were to go back to First Samuel, where they're doing all the wicked things, and maybe Habakkuk is seeing this, and he's and it's just breaking his heart. Because if we're falling after God and we see iniquity, it should break our heart. You know, I don't care what church it is. I don't care what denomination follows their name. I hate to be online or be watching the news and pop up that there was a pastor or somebody in the church that fell into a moral failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, again, what denomination, if it's Catholics, it still hurts all of us. It, it hurts my heart when that happens. And I can imagine Habakkuk is seeing this go on day in and day out. And then finally he sa- he's had all that he could take. And he says, Lord, just judge our land. Now the judgment that he was wanting went nothing like the judgment that God's response. And we'll look at that next in verses 5 through 11. In verse 5, uh, God, God begins his response. Says, Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye shall not believe, though it be told you. Now, the book of Habakkuk is much like the book of Job in that it is a conversation between God and a man. It's not to a multitude of people, it's to one person, they're going back and forth. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite, as far as just, that I think is funny, book or chapters in the Bible to read, is I believe it's Job 31, where... God has listened to Job complain for a few chapters then, and then the chapter, and then God shows up and he says, gird up your loins. In other words, he tells him, put your big boy britches on. We're going we're to have a talk. You know, you know, where were you when I hung the stars? Where were you when I, and, but, but that, that's one of my favorite, and that's kind of what we have here is Habakkuk and God going back and forth. And Habakkuk, or God tells Habakkuk that he is going to work a work. That even if he told him, he wouldn't believe it. And I don't have a problem believing that because there's a lot of things in our life that if God told us what was coming, we would want nothing to do with it. we We would say, I want to stay as far away from that as possible. I think one of the easiest examples in the Bible for us to go through and see someone's life who was probably like that is Joseph. Do you think if, if when Joseph was a child, God said, you know what? Your brothers are going to hate you. They're going to sell you into slavery. You're going to be a slave in Egypt. And then, just when you think things are going better, you're going to be thrown into prison and forgotten about. How many of you, if God told you, hey, I'm going to do that with your life, you'd be like, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. I want to do that. No, I, I don't think so. But then we also see the, at the end of Joseph's story that he had the uh, that he was able to look back and he was able to forgive his brothers and and he was able to tell them what you meant for evil, God meant unto good. Because right. I'm going to be honest, you know, it's one of those situations where God put the right person in that instance. Because if I were Joseph, I get a position of power. The first thing I'm doing is going and finding my brothers, and we're going to have a talk. And it's not going to end very well. But that's not what, what Joseph did. He waited for he, on God's timing there. Amen. But, but, God, but we see that and there's going to be things in our life that look unpleasant. And, uh, I've heard countless stories, but I'm not, a, or I'm not a painter or an artist. I can't paint a beautiful painting. I can paint a wall and make it look at least halfway decent. But as far as murals and things like that, no, I can't do that. But have you ever seen anyone paint? Some, someone who, who's good. Um, there was a, a man that I went to college with, and he was a painter. And he had told someone else that he could paint. He's like, oh, okay. Because, you know, abstract art. and you know, Anybody can be an artist if you go that route. But he says, hey, can you paint me? And he gave him a description of what he wanted to see. So and the, this young man begins to paint. And 
after, after so long, the, the, the other man asked him, says, hey, can I, how's the painting going? He said, oh, it's coming. He said, can I see it? He said, well, no, you don't want to see it right now. He said, no, 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 let me see it. He said, I'm telling you, you do not want to see it right now. He said, no, I want to see it. He said, okay. He goes and he gets the painting and shows it to him, and it just looks like a mess. You know, there's just colors everywhere, and, you know, he's like, yeah, and, you know, this other man's thinking to himself, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of painter I figured you were. You know, you, you say you're a painter, but you, you're not an artist. But then time goes on, and eventually this young man brings this painting to this, this man. It's just absolutely beautiful. And you see, whenever we're living in the here and now, it's much like that painting. There's going to be times where it's messy, it's ugly. Again, we wouldn't believe it if God told it to us, but it's all a part of the God's painting that's coming together. And oftentimes we're just a small piece of it. But God t- tells him that, and then he tells him about the army that he's raising up to, to bring judgment to uh, the land of Judah. And, I, and I, one thing I find interesting is as I read what God is saying about this army, uh, we talk about it a lot of times when I preach, when God uses adjectives, they really mean something. They're, they're, it's, you, it's not like, you know, uh, a fisherman telling a story, you know, the fish is actually this big, but by the 10th story, it's that big. You know, that, that's not God, God telling a story. So when God uses adjectives, I think, I think it's important, but this is what God says about them. In verse 6, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that, uh, that bitter and hasty nation. The first thing he calls them is bitter and hasty. But then it gets worse. We, we shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. He already tells, he's already telling back they're going to march through the land and they're going to take your houses. Because yeah, he says that are not theirs. So, and again, I think another reason to note that is... He's talking about the land of Israel, which was given as a promise, but he is telling Habakkuk that the Chaldeans are going to come in and take the dwelling places that are not theirs. I think that is twofold. One, it's not, it's not the land that God gave them. It's Israel's land, and then it's also physically not their houses. But because of their sin, God is taking their houses. But continuing on, they are terrible and dreadful. That's God talking about the, the, the Chaldeans. And he's calling them terrible and dreadful. He's letting Habakkuk know of the things that are to come. And we wonder why as we, as we continue on. and, and uh, Skipping ahead, but we'll, we'll move back for a second. In verse 12, uh, whenever we find uh, Habakkuk's response, he's questioning God. He's like, wait a second, God. But, we're, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But he, he, he continues and tells him that he, he says their horses are swifter than leopards. And when I read that, I'm thinking, man, I got to get a horse like that. A horse that's, that's swifter than a leopard. But, but and again, this is the words that he's using. And they're more fierce than the evening wolves. So you got a horse that is swifter than a leopard and more fierce than a wolf. That, that's something. And then their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. So God, God's already telling him so about this enemy. He says, they're hungry for violence. They can't wait for this. They're living for this moment. And that's what's coming. We find oftentimes throughout the scripture where God uses unlikely people. We, uh, one of the, to me, one of the things that jumps out to me, if we were to uh, turn there, we won't for time's sake, but turn back to the book of Genesis and look at the Tower of Babel. Now, when you go back there and you, uh, you're, you're, and you back up a little bit, you find you're coming uh, fresh off of the flood. Where God has destroyed all of mankind and all the animals uh, and everything on the face of the earth except those who were in the ark. And God gives them the, the instructions to spread out and multiply across the face of the earth. Amen. And it wasn't long after that that they're like, you know what? That's uncomfortable. That's not what I want to do. A little side note there. Sometimes... Following God's will gets you out of your comfort zone. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. 
Okay, and, and you can, I'm sure we could go around this room because that's one of the unique things about Calvary Baptist Church is there's not many of us that are actually from here, here. And it's not easy to move to a new place. It's not easy to go put yourself around a bunch of strangers. But that's what God told them to do. But they just say, you know what? I like it here. I like my neighbors here. And then they eventually decide, you know what? We're going to build a tower up to heaven. Now, that's something that's always confused me because I, I believe that heaven is probably another dimension. And the reason I say that is in instances like uh, whenever Stephen is stoned, the heavens opened up and he was able to see into heaven. So, and then, and so I don't believe, and even if, if, even if heaven is beyond outer space, and that's fine if that's where it is, I believe God can take care of it no matter where it is. But to build a tower up to heaven, they would eventually run out of oxygen. But, the, but what, what you find God saying is that nothing but shall be restrained from them. God has already made the promise that he will not destroy the whole world with water again. And I think... That what God is referring to in that moment is if these people are allowed to continue on like they are, then there's no way to correct them without destroying all of them again. So what he did was he confounded their language and, you know, they're working and you know, working on the uh, tower and one of them asked another one for the hammer and he's looking at him like, what are you talking about? And they can neither one understand each other anymore. So then they were forced to spread out. Because God uses unlikely circumstances oftentimes. And, 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 and one of the, so God was able to do that. So I believe, and this comes into it, whenever we split off into nations, God is able to use nation to correct a nation. And, if, and we see that through time and time throughout history. We find an example here, but in more modern times, um, if we were to go back to the world wars, it was... Nations rising up to because one nation or a couple of nations in World War II, especially it was the nation of Germany, had decided to go off the rails and decided they were going to exterminate a bunch of people. So God used a bunch of nations to settle Germany back down. And I believe that, that, that that's part of the reason why we have the Tower of Babel. But moving along, we'll come back to that in just a moment. We find Habakkuk's questions or his question. Now, I want you to think about what God has told him. God has told him that this heathen nation who doesn't even believe in the true God is going to be the ones to bring judgment. You know, at least Israel followed the right God. We, yeah, we find where, if we were to go back in the Bible, I, I always love the story when the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take him into the Temple of Dagon and they set him down there and Dagon can't even stand before the presence of our God. But yet, in this instance, God has had enough, enough of Israel to where he's going to use this heathen nation. So, Habakkuk is like, wait a second, God, Let, let's read what he says. Art thou not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer uh, eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And we'll pause there for, for a minute. But he's saying, Lord, you're, you're, you're more holy than I. You're so, uh, so holy. You're righteous. You're from everlasting. You know all these things. You're of pure eyes. And you're going to allow this to happen? This is what you've ordained? He's, he's upset about this. And, and I've tried to think about what that would be our equivalent. And I, and I thought, you know, when you, and of course there's a lot of countries that we can talk about, but the first one that probably comes to my mind is a nation like China. Because 
There are, that is a very tough place for missionaries to go. And uh, they do not allow Christians there. If you're caught with a Bible, it's punishable by death. So for, and you know, we, we look at our nation and yes, our nation has its problems. And for far too long, we allowed abortion. And we look at the things that are being crammed down uh, children's throats and the things that we're expected to accept today as being okay and, nor- and part of the norm. And we're just supposed to accept that with wide open arms. And and and. All the while, it spits in the face of the very God. But we're like, hey, you know, at least we've got churches. Hey, at least we send missionaries across the world. And and we we look in, and I believe that God is long suffering with our nation because of the good that we do. But there's going, but if if we're not careful, there's going to be a time when that runs out. And I don't know how long that is. And I'm not, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not one who's, uh, ba- who's praying for judgment on our nation. Again, I, I, I like the Second Chronicles 7.14 more where, you know, I would rather our nation be like Nineveh and turn from our ways and, you know, God hold his judgment off. That's the route that I would ra- rather us go. But could you imagine just for a moment that, you were, that you're Habakkuk and God has just told you that I am going to use this heathen nation that doesn't even believe that I exist to take down your country. Because that's what Habakkuk's been told. And, and, and there's no wonder his reaction is that that it is. Because, uh, again, he, he loves his country. He loves God. He loves everything that's going on. And he acknowledges in the beginning that, you know, you're a pure eyes to me, but how are you going to do this? He continues, and make us men as the fishes of the sea and as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. He, he's asking, why are you going to allow the anarchy, the, the, the mob rule, the whatever goes, go? Why are you going to allow that to happen? And I wanted to pause, and this is kind of the meat of the message, if you will. But the problem with Habakkuk in this moment is he's, us- is he's using the wrong tape measure. To measure up what what, what he should be. You see the thing is. Whenever I compare myself to somebody else. Even if they're better than me. I still feel better about myself. Than if I compare myself to God. Because man is imperfect. You know there's a saying. Men at best are still men at best. You know the, the best of men. Still have their sins that they struggle with. And so whenever, I, whenever you compare yourself to that, you're going to come up short. Now, I was working for a man, and I brought a specific tape measure tonight because I think it's relevant. And it's a Lufkin 25-foot tape measure, a, a, a nice brand. And, but I was working on this job, and we're framing up a closet. And if you've ever done any carpentry work or know anything about it, you want the suds of the wall to be tight with the ceiling. This wasn't a low barren wall, but so uh, we're framing it up and the, the, this man was giving me the measurements and uh, I went out and measured the two by four. And, you know, now I may not be the greatest carpenter in the world, but I know how to use a miter saw. OK, it's, it's pretty simple. You, 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 you take the tape measure. You know, measure twice, cut once. But you take the tape measure, measure it out, mark it. You know, uh, don't cut the line out, and, you, and there's your cut. So I go outside, I I take it and I measure it out, and and uh, I make the cut, and I come inside, and it's a little bit too short. I'm like, well, that's weird. Now I was getting a migraine. I, I struggle with migraines from time to time, but I was like, I don't think it's bothering me that bad at this moment. So he's like, okay, that's fine. But, you know, he gives me another measurement and I go out, I measure it out, double check myself, mark it, cut it, bring it in. It's a little bit too short. Okay, that's fine because, you know, we're still in the middle of the wall. You know, the nails will will make do. But this next cut is one that has to be perfect because it's the one that's by the door. So you want that one for sure to be tight. So he looks at me, he says, you have to cut this one right. It's like, okay, like, I don't know what I'm doing. But, and so he, so he tells me the measurement. I go outside, mark it off. And I remember thinking, I don't know what's going on. So I added a quarter of an inch to my measurement. Mark it off, cut it, take the two by four inside, and it's too short. 
He gets mad because it was our last two by four. And so that means he's going to have to go get one two by four. And I'm mad at myself because how do you mess up something so simple? And he goes outside, I take my tape measure, and I measure the board that I just cut, and sure enough, it is the exact length, it's actually a little bit longer, than what he told me to cut. Well, then he takes another tape measure, measures it, and it's too short. Okay, so now there's a problem here. Our tape measures are wrong. And apparently at some point, you probably can't see this, but this tape measure got dropped. Imagine that a tape measure getting dropped. And this, and the piece that you used to hook on whatever is bent backwards quite a bit. So, when, so by his tape measure, the cut that I was making was too short. By mine, it was perfect. And it's, it's much the same thing. And why is I this tape measure? I don't know. I should throw it away. But, uh, but whenever it comes to uh, measuring up as a nation, as whatever, when we compare ourselves using the wrong tape measure, and then at the end of the day, when we measure up to what God expects, it's going to be off. And... That was what was going through Habakkuk's mind is, but we do these good things. But, and you're going to let them to overtake us? But we have prophets in our nation. But we have this. We have temples. We actually worship you. But it didn't matter because he was using the wrong tape measure. The, the Bible actually tells us to him to, that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. So Israel, in that day, was held to a higher standard. Why? Because they knew better. You know, I've got an almost three-year-old and a one-year-old in the nursery tonight. There are things that Joshua does or doesn't do that he gets in trouble for that Jason does not. Why? Because Joshua knows better. Or maybe I should say Joshua gets in more trouble for because Joshua knows better. Or he should know better. As a Christian, there's things that you should know better than to do. But we all mess up. Another principle that we learn from the life of David as God is, or as Samuel is looking for the next king of Israel after, after Saul, after the kingdom has been rent from Saul. I've always found the story out funny because God tells Samuel he's in the house of Jesse. And Jesse finds out. And Jesse goes and he gets all of his boys. Except for one. How would you have liked to have been the one? I've always thought of that. Like, like, hey, hey, you know, they're sitting around the table that, that morning at breakfast. Hey, the prophet Samuel's coming by and one of you are going to be king, are, are, are going to be the next king of Israel. And you know, they're like, oh man, that, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, they're all thinking it's definitely going to be me. And, you know, so, and, and then Jesse, I can imagine him sitting there and saying, so I need all of you to stay here. Well, except for you, David. David, you go take care of the sheep. Could you imagine how that probably made David feel? But where do we find him? We find him taking care of the sheep. And whenever Samuel gets there and, and, and he has a lion pass by, and the Bible even says that Samuel was like, this is, the par this is the paraphrase version. This is the Jeremy version, I guess. But Eliab passes by and he says, you know, God, oh, that's got to be him. He looks the part. You know, if we were to put it in today's terms, he looked like the quarterback. He, he had that, uh, that appearance about him where, where he just looked like the leader and the person that would be the next king. And God says, nope, that's not him. Okay, so maybe not Eliab. Then ne the next one comes by and nope, not him. And God tells Samuel, you see as man sees, but I see what's on the inside. God wanted a man after his own heart in that instance. Well, I say in that instance, God still wants a man after his own heart. It didn't matter what he looked like. It didn't matter all those things. It was what was on the inside. We know when it comes to God's judgment that in other instances in the Bible, we find where Israel actually... We don't find anything they did wrong. We talked about Joseph earlier. Joseph brought uh, his family, which became you know, the nation of Israel, into Egypt. And when you back up to 
I believe it's Genesis chapter 16, you find where God tells Abraham that his descendants would be in, a, in Egypt for 400 years. Why? Because the sins of the Amorites was not yet full. So sometimes God is doing things that we don't understand why, but God is being long-suffering to somebody or whatever may be going on. So, it, so Israel found themselves as slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And I was thinking about that as I was going through my study, like they didn't do anything wrong. Why were they slaves? And I'm going to, and I'm going to say that they were slaves to make them uncomfortable, to make them unhappy in Egypt, to get them to go back to, the, to where God wanted them to be in Canaan land. We find the church in the book of Acts, things are going great. People are getting saved. There's just one problem. Much like at the, at the Tower of Babel, they weren't leaving Jerusalem. So what happened? Persecution, which spread the gospel. So God, and so, and when you think of the persecution that happened to the church, it was it was the Pharisees. It was men like Saul who were not saved. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so they were spitting in the face of God. And God was using them to persecute and even in some instances kill Christians. Why? To spread the gospel because they wouldn't listen. So again, be careful what, what you wish for. Now, let me, say, let me re, uh, say this again. America, the church, is not Israel. I understand that the book of Habakkuk was written to the nation of Israel. But I do believe that there are principles that found in these books that we can apply here. Because God does judge other nations besides Israel. And again, we find evidence for that in the, in the book of, uh, of uh, Jonah with Nineveh. And I'm afraid as we continue down this path, if we don't get, get, get things straightened out, judgment is coming for our nation. Yes, sir. Sure. And what are we going to do about it? Because we have to remember, first of all, that God's judgment can come from anywhere. In this instance, he was using Babylon and the, and the Chaldeans. And so God was using nations that were heathen nations to take over Israel and Judah. Why? Because they weren't listening. So God, so God can use whoever He wants. So we, we shouldn't be sitting here saying, we're still the best nation on earth. We're the most Christian nation on earth. Because again, to him that knoweth to do good and, do, and doeth it not, it is sin. sin. So it doesn't matter what good we're doing. The Bible also tells us that our righteousness is as, is as filthy rags. The good things that we do is as filthy rags. So whenever we are, are trying to be good, it's not impressing God. Because he is perfect. And God uses imperfect people to do his will. And I know that this may be a little bit of a strange message, but I believe it's the message that God ha ha has for us tonight. And I want to and, and I, and I reiterate. What are we doing to change things up? I, you know, I'm thankful that our church is a soul winning church. I'm thankful that we have GPS and I uh, really struggle to make it on Tuesday, Tuesday nights. Uh, but we should be trying to make a difference in our personal world. We may not be able to reach everyone and, and, and everything. But we can make a difference where we are. You know, like Brother Mike was talking about with his missionary uh, update. England is a very difficult place for missionaries. But I'm thankful for, if you look at the back of our bulletin, as Brother Mike said, we, have, we support several missionaries there in the United Kingdom. And I'm thankful for them. Because they're going to make a difference there. In our church, I think it's great that we support 52 missionaries. But if we're not going across the street to our neighbor, then what are we doing? When we're not checking on our own life, when we're not trying to clean up what's here, because that's where it all starts, is getting right here. First of all, that's salvation. If you're not saved, there's no time like the present. After salvation, hey, it's easy to get backslidden. And I believe that the Christian life is, one where you're, is where you're trying to become closer and closer to God as it goes on. And that's how we should be. And we should be just trying to make God happy. 
You know, when you love someone, you want them to be happy, right? There, there may or may not have been times in, you know, mine and my wife's marriage where I've done something to upset her. Uh, I know that may be shocking, uh, but there may have been a time or two that I've upset her. And can I tell you, it kills me when she's mad at me, especially when I know I messed up, which has only been, you know, like once ever. No, I'm just kidding. But when I know I've messed up is when it just kills me because I just want her to be happy. Why? Because I love her. So you try to make those that you love happy. So, what it, so where does that leave God on that list? I've heard it said, and we'll close with this. We often talk about the things that we love. And I'm afraid that's why we, we fail to talk about Jesus. You know, it's easy to talk about, you know, for me, I love sports. It's easy to talk about sports. It's easy to talk about, you know, my family. It's easy to talk about all those things. Because, because I love them. But then it can suddenly become difficult to talk about my Savior. What does that say about my own walk when that's the case?